Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Transplant Institute Lecture Series. Uh, we're very privileged today to have a, a wonderful speaker who's a good friend, Dr. Julie Heimbach, who uh, really needs no introduction in the transplant community. Uh, Dr. Heimbach is a liver transplant surgeon from Mayo Clinic, Rochester, where she serves as a surgical director of the liver transplant program and currently the chair of the division of transplant surgery there. And Julie uh, did her training in surgery at the University of Colorado and went on to do the transplant surgery fellowship at Mayo Clinic, where our own Dr. Dean Kim did his fellowship as well. And um, we interviewed her there after her fellowship to come to Henry Ford, but then she chose to go to Mayo. And my feelings are still hurt from that. But that's okay, we forgive her. So uh, she's done extremely well with her career there. She got an interest, as everybody in Mayo gets into cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma transplantation and living donor liver transplantation. It's a phenomenal program, one of the leading uh, programs in the world, as a matter of fact, in that space. And she acquired interest in liver transplantation for fatty liver disease and obesity in that context. And uh, they have uh, amassed together a, a nice set of uh, data that will inform us a little bit more about how to go about it in liver transplantation for this as we face the same challenges here in the Midwest. Uh, Dr. Heimbach is also very active in organized medicine in the transplant community. She's involved heavily with the American Society of Transplant Surgeons and also with the United Network of Organ Sharing where now she is chairing the most coveted, probably most painful liver intestine committee Everybody knows that once you finish serving that committee, you need a one month vacation, I think, to rest from that duty. But I do admire and Julie the uh, amazing level of openness, balance, equanimity, and uh, the amount of intellect that she packs together when she discusses controversial issues uh, in that context within our community. Once she gets talking, we always seem to have more clarity about the subject. And I'm, very excited to introduce her to you, and uh, welcome to Detroit, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Marwan, for that um, very kind introduction, and thank you for hosting me here. It's just a great program, and it's really an honor to be back here and to see Detroit, which is definitely, I think, on the upswing. It's really exciting to see that, so I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy to talk to you about this uh, subject, um, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, what we're going to try to cover today, just the sort of outline of the current scope of the obesity epidemic, what that um, is meaning for our specific patient population, um, both pre- and post-liver transplant, and then um, what the possible role of bariatric surgery could be for this particular patient population. But the overall global adults, so this is not just a problem in the United States, though we are certainly, as you can see from this sort of color scheme, we are leading this epidemic. Um, there are other countries which are filing, um, sadly, in our footsteps and, you know, not far behind. Um, so that I think really looking forward in terms of challenges to health care and to the, basically to human population, I really think this is sort of our number one health challenge, um, really overshadowing kind of all of the other things. And how is this happening? Well, you know, it's not, um, this is a whole talk that I could give you. Why is this happening and why is this happening over the time frame that it's happening? But it has to do, I think, you know, Air America running on Duncan. It's the reality is the type of food that we're eating now is very different than the type of food that we used to eat, um, such that everything is very calorie dense. Um, and of course, the amount of food is very different. So the portion distortion is the sort of catchphrase where people think that a certain an amount of food is normal, like so that a slice of pizza has evolved to be this ginormous um, amount. 
And then um, the sedentary lifestyle, I think, is one of the main drivers where we just really have lost um, the movement that we typically would have had in our normal day. Many people had, a, even on their job, would burn their calories you know, in their job, and that has evolved certainly to where that vast majority of people really don't expend any energy at work, but yet we're working longer hours, so that interferes both with our energy and our sort of life uh, ability to keep moving. So those are the things, and you can see that it's, you know, we all, of course, get centered on the liver, but um, how that really affects the whole body. I think this is a, you know, sort of an interesting image where you can just see all of the impacts and how different it is when you carry all this weight. Of course, decreased function, joint issues, um, the biggest risk for mortality being focused around uh, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, also um, greatly impacted by uh, obesity. And so looking specifically at transplant, um, what we can see, again, over that very short time frame, you can see the really big increase um, in, I'm trying to get that little arrow, in NASH as an indication for transplant. Um, looking at, this is for listing, so getting on the list, it's the second most common reason to be on the list. And then looking at an indication as um, why the patient actually has transplanted, um, you can see um, hepatitis C coming down, but um, when they have HCC going up, but this is decompensated NASH going up and decompensating alcohol going up, whereas decompensated hepatitis C going down. So really a lot of changes in terms of why patients are undergoing transplant in the current area compared to what we did even just five years ago. Um, again, showing an indication uh, for transplant, another data set, NASH and cryptogenic on the rise, whereas hepatitis C coming down. And this is actually for undergoing transplant as opposed to just being listed. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of pre-transplant patient selection? Um, remembering, of course, that obesity affects, as I showed you in that earlier picture, the whole patient, and the most common cause of death is actually cardiovascular disease. So that really has implications for screening of the patient because you need to be sure that, you know, that's not, um, that they're not going to have a cardiac event in the perioperative period. Um, and then, of course, the idea of sarcopenia has been something we've historically had a very good understanding in our patients with a BMI of 17 who are on the wait list and we're thinking about how to keep them alive to transplant. That same issue is being recognized in our obese patients with the concept of sarcopenic obesity, which seems like a complete oxymoron, but in fact we see that the patient has much less muscle mass and they're much less fit and that can have an influence on their pre-transplant weight list outcome as well as potentially on their post-transplant outcome. So this is an increasingly uh, recognized component. We don't exactly know how to get our arms around this yet, but I think it's uh, something to be aware of. In terms of perioperative concerns, it really is more than just how to get the retractor in so you can get adequate visualization to actually do the surgery on these big people. Obviously, that is one part of the concern, but we also worry about our perioperative outcomes because we are monitored very heavily. So this... Um, was previously a reason that people thought, well, we just really shouldn't do these patients. Heavy patients should not be transplanted because their outcomes are going to be worse. And that um, was supported by early data that was published in 2009, looking at SRTR data from really, you know, a long cohort from 87 to 2007 out of 68,000 patients. You can see that the cohorts with the low and high BMIs were just a fraction, so very small numbers, less than 2,000 with the low BMI and less than 1,500 with a high BMI. Both groups, you can see this is the group with 18, and this is the group with 40, both groups inferior to post-transplant survival for patients who are between 18 and 40. But the um, criticism of this, of course, would be that there is a very low number of patients in these low and high BMI groups. And of course, this is a, quite an old cohort of data now going back to 1987. Certainly what we're doing today is is quite different. Um, also, there was no correction for ascites in th that patient population of obesity. So if you subtract actually for ascites, that um, can really change actually what the BMI is because of course that's just weight and height as a calculation. 
So when you look at a more um, up-to-date cohort using the same exact data set, SRTR data, um, people have looked at that in a variety of different ways. There's actually multiple publications now that have come out in the last five years, essentially all showing the same thing. Patients with a BMI less than 18 still have wor the worst outcomes, um, but for the heavy patients, essentially, whether you divide them up into males or females or any other BMI cohort, selected patients, now these are patients that we chose and that made it through wait list and made it to transplant and then were post-transplant, they have a similar outcome to the non-obese patients. But again, that's not every obese patient. That's the ones that we selected to transplant. Um, looking also at data for outcome for NASH as a specific diagnosis, this is independent of BMI, just the NASH patients also having um, long-term, this is a 10 uh, post-transplant 10-year outcome study showing that the NASH patients actually have a satisfactory outcome compared to some of the other indications for transplant, quite similar um, to many of the other indications for transplant. So the specific diagnosis of NASH does not perform worse in terms of long-term outcomes. So that maybe tells us that we should not uh, be as concerned. This is just a summary, and it's too small for any of you to read back there, but you can see there's a numerous different patient, uh, different studies that have looked at this with SRTR data um, several times, and then this is the NIDDK database that we looked at at Mayo, um, and then uh, single center data as well as that most recent up-to-date thing, and, and for the most part, no difference in terms of post-transplant survival. Now, what about complications? This is, again, kind of too small for those of you in the back to read, but there have been many single-center studies. It's very hard to do outcome-based data on national data sets because there's really not um, granular enough to look at specific complications. But in general, um, the outcomes are, are satisfactory, although there are higher specific complications in some of the reported series. So this most recent one from the UK, increased hospital and ICU length of stay, more infections. Um, this was a single center US, uh, 1,200 patients, very large study, um, showing longer OR times and length of stay, but no difference in survival. Again, longer length of stay, um, some increased wound complications. So Complication rates potentially higher, but in terms of overall outcomes, still satisfactory. But what about further paths? Not just looking at perioperative patient and graft survival and complication rates. What about longer term outcomes? Does the obesity start to matter then? Because we're not doing transplant just to get patients out of the hospital and getting our one year survival. The point of transplant is hopefully to give patients excellent function in the long term. And when we looked, um, and this is quite an old publication now from 2010, but actually this is data that was generated um, from Kim Watt at Mayo Clinic, and looking at the NIDDK data set, which was a prospective multi-center uh, study, um, looking at those patients who had been studied in that group, how they did in the long term, we saw the long term risk of mortality included some of the obesity related comorbidities, especially diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and malignancy. So, for the group of patients who died from the non um, hepatic causes of death, you can see several of these being linked to obesity. We couldn't look at obesity specifically because back when we were doing this, we really didn't transplant obese patients, so we didn't have any to study for the most part, but we could see um, that obesity-related comorbidities that the patients who developed obesity in the long term suffered from. More recently, this is a multi-center paper from Australia looking at a reasonably large number of patients, 600 patients. The um, good thing about this paper is they looked at um, longer-term outcomes, so you can see that their follow-up in this going out to 12 years Patients who had both obesity and diabetes clearly with inferior survival in this um, Kaplan-Meier curve showing outcomes definitely worse um, over the long term when they've had the combination of obesity plus diabetes, whereas interestingly, the non-obese, non-diabetic were just exactly the same as the obese, non-diabetic patients in terms of the long-term outcome. So really, um, it's that combination metabolic syndrome that really seems to affect the long-term outcome.
And in terms of the risk of recurrence of the primary disease that the patient had a transplant, that is also a concern, um, whether it's de novo NAFLD, meaning the patient was originally transplanted for some other condition and then became obese post-transplant, or recurred um, with their primary disease, it seems like that is a real issue to be concerned about over time, although the need to actually progress to cirrhosis and transplant still seems to be at a relatively slow pace. So what are the options? What can we actually do about this? Well, it'd be nice if we could go back to the time in the 30s where we were giving people tapeworms, but that probably isn't going to be very um, appealing to most patients. So we have to look at other, other options. And this looks like, um, this is a very elegant study actually that had paired biopsies. And this is not in a transplant population, but this is just looking specifically at the impact of weight loss on the liver and on the progression of fibrosis. And this was a group of 45 patients who were followed for almost five years and they actually had serial biopsies. And we can see that the patients from biopsy one to biopsy two who were able to have more than 10% total body weight loss had for the most part um, either stabilization or regression of their fibrosis. So, and that was a very strong predictor. And some of these patients had bariatric surgery, some of them had um, medical management, but those who were able to achieve the weight loss had actual improvement in their liver, whereas those that had between zero uh, and 10%, or those who had weight gain, um, did not have that improvement. So, how can we achieve this weight loss, this 10% total body weight loss to stabilize that liver? Um, we do know, we've known for a long time, that bariatric surgery does provide effective long-term weight loss. This is data from Sweden where they have national health care. And in this, they were able to establish over a 15-year follow-up the durability of um, gastric bypass at achieving weight loss. So you can see that the patients, all of the patients, regardless of what type of bariatric surgery they have, they achieve weight loss, whereas the control group, which was considered for surgery but did not undergo surgery, um, did not achieve weight loss. Those patients that did have surgery had weight loss, and you can see that it is quite durable for most patients. Um, so we know that it does work. And we also know, this is more recent data from last year, this is from a group in Utah, published in the New England Journal, that, that also is not only is it effective in long-term weight loss, so this is 12-year follow-up in patients who were referred for bariatric surgery, and some of them were able to undergo bariatric surgery, some of them weren't. Uh, those that weren't primarily were not allowed because of their insurance. Some of them were allowed to cross over eventually, which it was good, um, but you can see this is um, the change in body weight loss, and then we can see from the non-surgery group to the surgery group, quite a difference with a 95% reduction in new onset type 2 diabetes and a 50% resolution of type 2, type 2 diabetes at 12 years. So with long-term follow-up, this seems to be an effective strategy in patients in general. Um, so what are the different kinds of um, options for patients? And this is not you know, patients who are having liver transplant, but this is in general just information about bariatric surgery. You can kind of group bariatric surgery into two different strategies. One is the purely restrictive surgeries, and then there's the restrictive and the malabsorptive uh, surgeries. And in terms of restrictive, lap band was something that was actually quite popular, um, primarily because it was kind of, I think, viewed as maybe less risky um, in terms of Efficacy, however, is starting to really have a lot of questions about it. It does have a low rate of serious complications, but it really is not very effective. And so I think certainly in our program um, and in many others, this is becoming less popular because of the fact of it not really being able to work. And if you were thinking about it in a patient population with you know, liver disease, you might have some concern that you could have access to any distal varices that could still be present in that band that is placed around the stomach. The sleeve um, has slower weight loss because it's only restrictive, does seem to have a similar low rate of complications, appears to be durable, but this does not have the length of follow-up as does the Rui gastric bypass. And certainly there is preservation of access to biliary tree and any kind of varices in terms of implications for for liver patients. In terms of the combination surgery, Ruin Y is certainly the gold standard. 
with a long-term uh, data to show that it does appear to be effective, and I've already shown you that data from two different uh, series over 12 years of follow-up. Relatively low complication rate, of course, that relates to patient selection. Um, and uh, there, however, in this cohort, um, the question of whether, you know, in a patient that already had uh, compensated cirrhosis, whether you would have issues with when they became decompensated and accessing, you know, distal varices from an endoscopic route. Another concern about this is the rapidity of the weight loss, whether you were doing this pre or post liver transplant, um, there's a, it is a rapid, more rapid weight loss um, that can lead to some instability for the patient. A duodenal switch is a very uh, aggressive of surgery um, for severe obesity. I think it's really not something to necessarily consider on someone that has cirrhosis or who's had a transplant. So I think that would be reserved for only a very rare um, group of patients. This is just showing you what these look like. So there's the band, um, the sleeve, this is the gastric bypass, and this is the switch. So in terms of who, you know, could we think about bariatric surgery, um, it has been done, um, both pre-transplant, peritransplant, post-transplant, um, and we'll kind of cover all those different, uh, different timings. So it actually has been done, um, bariatric surgery in patients with cirrhosis. Um, the case series are small, um, and in general, these are compensated patients with uh, known cirrhosis or known fibrosis. Um, what is reported in these small series between 13 and 23 patients um, that in general, they feel like for child's A patients that this is generally safe, um, selected, highly selected patients. They do note things like complication rates to be higher. In these series, there's only a very small number of patients who then had a decompensating event like the development of new onset ascites, but that is described, but it's a small number, um, and generally appears in the short-term uh, follow-up to be effective at improving the liver and uh, reducing the weight. But that's a very selected group of patients. We don't have a lot of child's A patients that are coming to the transplant center. And I think this is an important uh, paper because it gets around the idea of selection bias and publication bias as well. We typically, as surgeons, don't like to write papers about um, outcomes when, the paper, when it doesn't work. Um, and this gets around that because this is using the nationwide inpatient sample data. So this is a sample of um, cases that are reported nationally over a long cohort. Um, and they were able to gather data on you know, almost 700,000 patients. And patients were identified as having that uh, bariatric surgery, very small number that luckily, very small number with decompensated cirrhosis, almost 4,000 patients with compensated cirrhosis, and then you know, 600,000 with no cirrhosis. The diagnosis code of ascites or varices was required to be classified as decompensated. In hospital mortality, in that group of decompensated cirrhotic patients, it's 16%. So you really should not be doing an elective surgical procedure that has a 16% mortality, obviously. But even those patients who have compensated cirrhosis had a 0.9% mortality compared to a 0.3% in hospital mortality for the non cirrhotic patients. So um, length of stay was also higher, um, and I think this is important data to be aware of. What about doing a liver transplant after the patient has had bariatric surgery? Actually, this is a paper from Henry Ford. You guys looked at your outcomes, so I probably don't need to share this with this audience so much, but I think it's an interesting report. Um, one day on service two weeks ago, we had six patients in the hospital who had previously had bariatric surgery who are waiting for transplants. So this is a more and more common uh, situation. Um, and outcomes in this series were 11 patients who had previously had bariatric procedures. This paper um, noted um, that the length of stay seemed um, sort of in line with what they had previously uh, seen in the other patients who did not have um, bariatric interventions prior to transplant, but there was actually not a control group to compare this to, but they did have a control, you did have a control group for the uh, post-operative survival, showing a generally similar outcomes um, for those with and without bariatric surgery. So it's, you know, certainly a, something that we're all going to be facing more often. So thinking about this globally, in decompensated cirrhotic patients, which is really our patient population in liver transplant, I hope that I've already convinced you that it's really not an option to think about bariatric surgery for patients with decompensated cirrhosis. It may be an option to consider after transplant, and it may be an option to consider concurrent with transplant. And we'll kind of talk about those. So there are several series now. 
post-liver transplant bariatric surgery being reported. Um, this is the, the larger of the series, and it only has nine patients. It, it was done from the group uh, in California, and the mean time from transplant was about six years. They had um, actually three patients who required a reoperation in the first 30 days, which would be higher than you would expect in a non transplant um, gastric uh, sleeve patient population. But in a short follow-up, they had excellent weight loss. Um, and so concluding from their uh, short study that they felt it was a satisfactory intervention. This paper uh, is from the University of Minnesota looking at open RUI gastric bypass done after liver transplant. I think this one makes you want to be a, a little bit more uh, concerned. And this would be um, because they had two patients who died in the first year and one patient that had to have a reversal out of seven, um, so that's almost 50% of the study population with a pretty um, severe adverse outcome. So I think that would the data are very limited, but more data on sleeve, and I would say overall, based on the very limited data, sleeve might be the more safe approach in this group. Certainly they had very effective weight loss with the post ruwai gastric bypass BMI getting down to 26 um, when the pre was 44. Um, and they had good long-term, I mean the follow-up was long, um, but it still is a concern. Um, this is a more recent paper. This was just published uh, about six months ago. Six patients, again, um, post-liver transplant sleeve gastrectomy. They had three that were open and they had three that they were able to do lap. Um, it's a pretty good long follow-up at 37 months. They did have one leak with subsequent uh, death related to that, um, and then another patient had to have a reoperation for infected mesh. So they, again, had a similar conclusion that it's very effective at weight loss, but they had um, concern about the complications that may present in this. But again, we're dealing with very small numbers. So I think it's kind of an open question. What are we doing in Rochester? Well, um, we actually have now developed a protocolized approach. We've been doing this since 2009, so a pretty long time. Why did we do this? Well, we first saw that we had a third of our list with obesity, and we also saw that our, our, our approach was inconsistent. Before we started a protocol, we um, had, depending on which surgeon they saw, the patient was given a different message about how much weight they did or did not have to lose. We <laughs> actually saw that the number was quite different depending on if it was a woman or a man, uh, the patient, and uh, that was interesting, I thought. Um, so I felt like we really, just like we do for our alcohol patients, we need to have a very consistent approach, and all of the patients are asked essentially to do the same thing. Um, and then we've been able to modify that protocol based on what we've learned. And so all patients who have a BMI of 35 are enrolled in the pre-transplant protocol. The aim is just like with alcohol, we have the four step approach, a little bit fewer steps, but our goal is to try to get these patients to lose weight prior to transplant with the aim of trying to get them under 35. We ask them to do it. It's a pretty simple strategy. They have a follow a calorie restricted diet, which we develop with our dietitians. The patients keep a food record, they bring it back, the dietitians look at it with them and help them with it. Um, we ask them to weigh and record their weight, and then we um, also focus on developing specific activity plans, bearing in mind that many of our patients have a lot of mobility issues. Um, we, do, we did for a long time provide them with a pedometer to help them um, track their progress. So that was the approach we um, designed. And we published our early um, results back in 2012 for those patients who were not able to achieve that goal of weight loss prior to transplant. We did offer a combined sleeve gastrectomy at the time of liver transplant. Um, so most of our patients actually were able to lose weight, but we had, um, in fact, you know, almost 70% of our patients at the time that we looked at this were able to lose weight, but we had a group that was not able to lose weight, some of them because they were referred really too late and they were too sick. We can't really start asking someone with a MELD score of, you know, 35 to lose weight. That's not realistic, but if so if a patient that is referred to late didn't have enough time, or the reality is a lot of patients had many years and they still couldn't lose the weight, we offered them the combined surgery. And looking at, this is our early reports, we had uh, 37 who were able to lose the weight, thus they did not get offered the sleeve, compared to seven who had the sleeve. Um, certainly the um, BMI at the time of transplant was much different. This was by design. We had 
a BMI of 33 for the patients who lost the weight, of course, and a much heavier BMI for those that did not, um, with the range being 39 to 52. Um, in terms of early uh, follow-up, we saw no post-transplant diabetes in this cohort with about a third post-transplant diabetes in the um, patients who were able to lose the weight. And unfortunately, some of those who lost the weight regained their weight, um, whereas we did not see that weight regain in the sleeve patients. Um, we really minimal difference in OR time. So this is just a picture of what it looks like with a beautiful new liver in there and then the sleeve um, right under that. Um, we've recently published our experience now with longer term outcomes. Um, that is just published a couple of months ago in hepatology. We had this time 29 patients, I think we're at 33 now, but 29 who had had the combined surgery, 17 of them had more than three years of follow-up. So we really focused this paper on the long-term outcome. So we just uh, did the analysis for those of three years of, or more of follow-up, and we had 36 with liver transplant alone, those that had lost the weight, as you can see. And what we saw at, at transplant, they're right here, um, the red is the sleeve patient, so we did have some weight loss, as you can see, from the time of listing, but they really didn't lose as much from the time of listing as the patients who were not offered the sleeve. This is, again, by design, because if you lose the weight, we don't need to have the sleeve. But for the patients who were not able to lose the weight, we offered the sleeve, and you can see that they continued to have excellent weight loss, and at three years, were able to maintain that, whereas unfortunately those who had the liver transplant and lost the weight, then we had some patients regaining that weight. So um, that total, more than 10% total body weight loss, um, only a third of the patients in the liver transplant alone cohort were able to maintain that, while 100% of the combined patients were able to maintain that greater than 10% total body weight loss, which again was the number that was needed to keep your liver healthy from that paired biopsy study that I told you about already. Um, so that's encouraging, certainly. And this is just another way to show you the exact same data. This is the BMI at the time of listing, almost 50 for the combined liver transplant sleeve patients. By the time of transplant, we had them down to you know 45 or 44, whereas the other patients were under 35, as I already described, that was what we asked them to do. And then post-transplant, much more similar, but then in the long term at two years, you can see those curves flipping, um, and these patients are able to maintain that BMI right around 30, which really has a big difference in terms of their metabolic outcomes, looking at insulin resistance and development of new onset diabetes. They have less diabetes, less hypertension, lower triglycerides, um, also improved, you know, we don't actually do biopsies in this patient population, but it would be nice if we did. Um, but we do do ultrasounds, and we can look for steatosis, and we have a very low incidence of that. Um, so in terms of practical tips, if you're thinking about, you know, embarking on this, I've certainly learned a lot by taking care of all these patients. I think, um, Having a standardized approach is very important um, with very specific nutritional activity and weight loss goals. Um, I think unless the patients have a very uh, clear granular plan, um, you know, you can't just tell them to lose weight because that will not work. Nobody can do that because they need more specific guidance. Even with specific guidance, it's quite challenging. But um, I think following the patients prior to transplant allows you to select the patients that will be able to do this because it's definitely not easy. Um, and you definitely, patient selection, just like most things in surgery, is very important. The patient needs to understand, number one, that they need to lose weight, and number two, that they're not able to lose weight without having the surgery because you you know, you can't put the stomach back in after you've taken it out. And if they weren't all the way sold on the idea, then they're not going to be very happy with, with anything after the transplant and the sleeve together. So they need to understand that they not only need the operation, but that they want the operation because they understand that they weren't able to do it by themselves. From a standpoint of, you know, just being in the operating room and the technical aspects, the distribution of obesity, I think everybody understands some patients have their weight sort of the apple shape and some people are the pear shape and that certainly makes a difference in terms of how challenging the surgery will be. Patients with ascites, you know, really makes it very easy to do the surgery because there's plenty of room. Um, and uh, another important consideration is the development of reflux. Um, 
Reflux is a big issue for these patients. I don't know if it has to do with cell sept. All of our patients do take cell sept for the first two months. I don't know if that's a component of this, but certainly reflux is a big issue. We've been able to manage that with caraphate. Excess weight loss is something you have to monitor for. The first patient we ever did, you know, went down to a BMI of 24, which is kind of nerve wracking because we started at 48. Um, and we didn't know where he was going to go, but um, with close follow up and making sure that you are, um, they're maintaining their protein intake, um, you know, I think it's, it would be fine. But if we weren't following him closely and making sure he was taking in this, in, um, it could be a very big issue. So you definitely have to be com compulsive and committed to follow up and follow up of the patients very closely. Unfortunately, weight regain is also an issue. And specifically at the three year time point is when we start to see the weight gain. We think that is in part, it's just an image that shows you the sort of distribution, whereas this patient has all of his weight in the lower part of his abdomen. This is a very much harder patient because the um, weight is in the upper abdomen, so it's a technically more challenging surgery. Another thing we've learned is this is a liver kidney patient. They have this very edematous Panis, this is a, a wound vac, actually. The wound is closed as per normal, but this is like this Provena wound vac system where you can just put it right over the closed wound, and it really helps manage this edema because otherwise, this, especially the kidney wound, will just fall apart. But if you put this uh, closed vac on there, you know, there's like 200 cc's of fluid that comes out of that wound every day, and the wound closes, and it's good. So this would be another little trick that we've learned. Um, our diet is very um, restrictive. This is different than our normal sleeve patients. Um, you can see this is, you know, basically three months before they're on sort of a regular eating strategy, um, and I think this is very important as well. And then you also have to make sure they're getting 80 grams of protein, even though they're on the clear liquids and the full liquids and the pureed diet for three weeks. It's a, it's, a big, um, it's a big effort, it takes a lot, um, but uh, other people are starting to write about this combined uh, surgery as well. This is just published from, uh, in Europe, uh, a group, they just had one case, but they felt like they were happy with it. This is a group of three published from um, Israel, and I th I've heard anecdotally that a couple of other programs have started as well. I, um, I know UCSF has done one. Our, our group in Arizona is doing them as well. So it's starting to become something that more people are doing. Um, so just again to walk you through uh, in closing the different algorithms for a patient with compensated cirrhosis. So this is maybe not the patient that we're seeing in the transplant population, but maybe in the hepatology clinic. Those patients, the, really the goal is to attain that greater than 10% total body weight loss um, because that can actually improve the whole situation and maybe they're not even going to come to transplant. And if you can think about any kind of non-invasive weight loss, that is the ideal intervention population. Um, and if not, that is a group that you could think about, sleeve gastrectomy. You could also think about the RUI gastric bypass, but I, I would be very cautious about that report, just primarily because of the rapidity of the weight loss that can push the patients into a decompensated state. The decompensated patient population, if they're a transplant candidate, you can think about in selected patients, trying to get them to achieve weight loss prior to transplant. Um, and then you can think about a sleeve gastrectomy either during or after liver transplant as another strategy. So to summarize again, for selected liver transplant patients, um, post-transplant outcomes do appear to be acceptable, though notably the perioperative complications may be higher. Long term, we do see the outcomes being impacted by obesity. So that looking at options of lifestyle modification, pre-transplant obesity surgery could be an option for highly selected patients. Post-transplant obesity surgery, if you're going to go that route, based on the limited data that is available, the LAP um, sleeve might be the best approach. A combined approach could be an option for selected patients who have not attained the goal weight at uh, transplants. And I'm happy uh, to take any questions that you might have. We need to record that. Kim? Uh, in the perioperative phase, what's your target calorie goal for those patients? 
So you mean before transplant in the non-invasive or right after? Right after when they're on full liquids, clear liquids, soft mechanical. Yeah, so we try to get the, the protein is our number one target. Mm -hmm. We're targeting 80 grams of protein. Um, and then we look at mills of fluid. Um, and so dehydration is an issue. So we monitor that as well. We try, we think it's probably not realistic for them to get more than about 1,500 uh, cc's of oral fluid intake and 80 grams of protein. And, and the second question is, um, we recognize that obesity probably plays a role, uh, not just with patients with advanced liver disease, but also cardiac failure, renal failure. Um, have, you, have you thought about a strategy for your patients who are undergoing either heart transplantation or kidney transplantation with a similar goal? Yeah, so in the kidney group, um, you know, there, we've gone around and around on this, and we're trying to come up with a coherent strategy. Um, for a while, we were basically offering kidney transplant to everybody without any regard to obesity, but seeing that the long-term outcome really wasn't where we wanted it to be. Unfortunately, I think we've swung too far to the other side where we're just basically telling them to come back when their BMI is under this, you know, and it actually we have it different depending on the age of the patient, um, but it's in the neighborhood of 40, uh, 35 to 40, depending on the age of the patient, um, and w without providing them a lot of assistance. So right now we're working with our bariatric team to try to develop a coherent approach to the pre-transplant kidney patient. The heart group, um, you know, is, uh, they're very restrictive in terms of what they would offer, and I think, um, they haven't been as sort of, you know, looking at the whole patient because they have more patients than they can handle already. So it's, I think, probably easier for them to focus on the ones that they're more confident in taking care of. But I think it's a big issue for sure. Uh, Julie, really a great talk. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, I, I may have missed this. Did you mention who's actually doing the sleeve gastrectomy? No, that's and, good. I should have, yeah. And if it's mm -hmm. a bariatric surgeon, then the first question is, how did you get them to take call with you? But uh, maybe you could talk about the, the buy-in that you had to get from the surgeons. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. I, I forgot to say that, but um, usually I do say that. It is the bariatric team that comes in and actually does the sleeve part of the surgery. Um, and we've engaged them from the very start. Before we ever did the first one, we you know, went to them and said, you know, what do you think of this idea? Um, and, and they were excited about it, I guess. Um, I, I think it would be very important to include them for two reasons. One is there's a concept of center of excellence for bariatric surgery as well, and they have certain um, requirements for centers of excellence with regard to the operative experience so that from a credentialing standpoint, the transplant surgeons would have to do like 500 cases before they could be approved to do surgery in the um, center of excellence. So I also think if you're going to do something that is definitely not the standard of care and is definitely um, sort of a new idea, it's much better to do it with a buy-in of all the teams that would be involved, all the stakeholders. So having them involved from the very start was great. Um, they're, they seem to be happy. We almost always do these at night. Um, we call them, you know, a couple of hours. You know, we, we know when it's going to happen. We call them. They kind of talk amongst themselves and figure out who's going to do it. Um, and and they're, they're in. They're excited because we, they've met the patient, and they know that the guy's usually dying because they're in the hospital. And, you know, they, can, they don't usually get involved in patients who are critically ill, and so it's kind of interesting to see the transformation. Um, I, I will tell you the story. The first guy we ever did, this I told a couple people this story already, but it's it's really kind of illustrates what this does. So liver transplant is very transformative. You know, you take a patient who's sort of more abundant is not going to leave the hospital without a transplant, and, you know, they have a transplant, and two months later they're, you know, back at work sometimes. They can really is so dramatic, but similarly with this, um, this patient, the first patient we ever did, you know, he was just, he just had NASH, so he had no diabetes or heart disease, but he also had very bad uh, hips. He basically couldn't walk, and he had had his liver disease discovered because he went for, um, he's going to have his hip replaced, and then, you know, couldn't have that done because he was found to be cirrhotic, and uh, we went down the path, and he had his transplant, he had his sleeve, his BMI was down to 25, and he didn't need the hip surgery anymore. He was walking around, he was super mobile, and he, he called me on my cell phone. He's like, Doc, I just wanted you to know I'm in line at Walmart, and I'm buying my own groceries. You know, he was like so fired up that he could walk around the store. That was like 
to him, so much of a big deal. You know, he didn't really care that he wasn't yellow anymore, but the fact that he could walk around the store was like the big deal, and he never needed to have his hip done because he could walk just fine once his weight was down. So I think that is something that you don't appreciate. Um, I had another patient who, you know, he was a huge guy, and he hadn't been doing anything, and, you know, four months after transplant, he was on this... Centurion bike ride with his family, and he rode 40 miles, you know, around the city of Minneapolis with his family, and you know, and his daughter and him and his wife, and they were all so amazed at that could happen, and you know, that that's the kind of thing that can happen. So that's that's why it's good, I think, it really transforms the patient. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Uh, great presentation and great lecture. Uh, my question is, we recently looked at the. Uh, the obesity versus the weightless outcome and post-transplant outcome by UNOS data. And the post-transplant outcome was not really affected by the obesity, like even like OBMI, BMI over 40, but weightless outcome was affected. And then the, the slide is showing, showing like a setting some goal, the weight goal before the transplant, and then probably waiting until like meet the goal, need to the transplant. I think that the part of the reason to see like a worse outcome, the worst weight outcome of the obesity patient is that like just just waiting, waiting until the patient meet the goal, and the patient probably die before meeting the goal. So, do you think uh, we just do a liver transplant with gastric, like sleep gastrectomy, and then just because obesity didn't really affect the post transplant outcome based on the UNOS data, so rather than setting the goal, just doing transplant with bariatric surgery. Do you think that's a good idea or better idea? Well, I think, um, obviously, we think it's a good idea to do both because that's what we do. Um, I think when you look at UNOS data, you have to remember that those outcomes are in patients that we made a decision to transplant. So that is not every patient that you see. That is a selected patient that, you know, the team saw, everybody bought into the fact that this is going to be a good patient. So not every patient is appropriate for liver transplant, and not every patient is appropriate for a liver transplant with a sleeve gastrectomy. But I do think, you know, the idea that obese patients do worse on the wait list is, I think, in part because, yeah, we agree to list them, but nobody's ever going to transplant them. They, you know, you see them there, and the surgeon just doesn't accept the organ for them because they don't want to do that patient. Um, so just getting on the list is the first hurdle. Obviously, there are other issues related to the size of the donor organ and whether you can, you know, make that work. And there's a number of, of factors, but I'm sure that we are all less willing to operate on heavy patients because we feel, you know, a concern that they might not do as well, um, especially if we don't have an approach. And I think if you don't have a plan, I mean, there are three ways you can do it. You can just say no to everybody who's heavy. You can just transplant everybody who's heavy and just hope that it works out in the long term and accept that they're going to be heavy after transplant and accept that they might have some long-term outcomes. Or you can try to make a plan that handles both of the problems. And when you do it, whether you do it immediately at the time of transplant or down the road, it's hard to say. But I think um, you know maybe going forward, there's going to be an endoscopic approach that could be helpful. Or maybe there'll be a drug or maybe... You know, we'll all be growing our own food and doing a lot better with our nutrition. I mean, there's a lot of things. You know, all the pieces of this can come together, hopefully. Um, but I think the, the worst thing is just, you know, not dealing with it. I, I think that does not help the patient. Thank you. Are there other cutoffs which might exclude patients from this protocol? Are like a hard BMI stop at 50 or 55 or an A1C target or threshold like where the A1C is over 8 or over 9 where you would say this is too far advanced, we're not going to apply our threshold or we're not going to apply our protocol to this patient? We don't have anything to do with their diabetes because we know that, you know, that is going to change very dramatically after the surgery. And we also don't have an upper BMI cutoff so far. Um, but we definitely require the patient to be, you know, not having heart disease because just like a skinny patient with heart disease, it doesn't go well um, at the, you know, so cardiovascular disease is an important component that you have to, uh, you know, have the same exact bar that we have for our thin patients true for that. Um, mobility is also important. So if the patient is is very heavy and they can't get out of bed, I think that's a patient that we probably would not do because, 
not being able to get out of bed and being skinny, we almost don't do those patients either. And then if you add 200 and, or 300 pounds onto that, you know, it's just not going to go well. So they need to be mobile. And if they're not mobile, we rehab them um, and try to get them mobile. That last one, you just saw that patient with the sort of vac on. She um, really had, we do a six minute walk test, but she couldn't even walk, you know, 20 steps. And so we did put her into rehab and to her credit, she, you know, was able to get through that and improve her function. And we just did her transplant, you know, two weeks ago. Her BMI, when she came to us, was 64 and she was immobile. And now at the time of her transplant, she was at 58, but she was quite mobile. So it was a completely different patient. One comment and one question. The comment is that uh, the heart transplant patient, the decompensated liver transplant candidate, uh, these patients are probably sick enough to consider a simultaneous uh, transplantation with the sleeve gastrectomy. The kidney patient usually is not that sick, uh, maintained on good dialysis or being considered for preemptive transplant. So the question of uh, doing the simultaneous operation may not come up as often in the kidney transplant patient. The question I had was, have you had any difficulty in achieving drug levels in patients who undergo sleeve gastrectomy simultaneously with transplantation? Yeah, let me just be clear on your first point. I completely agree with you that there's really no benefit to a simultaneous sleeve with kidney transplant. It's not the same incision. I mean, the main reason this, the exposure is perfect for the sleeve. The stomach is just right there. With a kidney, of course, that would be a separate incision or you would be doing a, you know, lap sleeve mm -hmm. and then a kidney or, you know, that's, and plus they can't drink as much fluid and you, you really would put that kidney at risk. I think it would be the wrong thing to do in a kidney unless, I, I mean, there's maybe a selected group that only wanted to have one recovery, but I, you'd have to be really religious about the fluid and other things would be um, affected by that. So there's not a, a strong push to do it. I think you can safely operate on most dialysis patients mm -hmm. and you could also safely do it post-transplant if you wanted to. So there's a lot of different open strategies for that group. Um, in terms of the second part of your question, with the sleeve, we have not seen any issues with drug absorption. With the gastric bypass, there could be issues. Um, and especially when you think about kidney transplant in the gastric bypass, because oxalosis is an issue, secondary oxalosis in a gastric bypass is an issue um, for kidney patients in particular. But the sleeve does not. Um, we looked at our incidence of steroid resistant rejection. It was actually lower in this population. Um, and so we haven't seen that problem at all. One other question. How long does it take to lose enough weight after a sleeve gastrectomy? How long does it, what was that? How long does it take for the patient to achieve the target weight after sleeve gastrectomy? Yeah, that's good. So, um, you know, if you looked at it, the, you know, the BMI is about 30. And so none of them are even in the normal range, you know, normal BMI is under 25, and we never get to that. But when they start over 50, I think we've really changed things for them anyway. And that weight loss is achieved somewhere between um, one and two years, um, closer to two years. And most patients are able to maintain that, but you can see after three years, we do see weight gain. Um, it seems to be more common in female patients than in male patients. Um, and so I think focusing between the three and five year mark, especially with the behavioral interventions that the bariatric team is most suited to provide, I think that's uh, important. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, how much time does doing the sleeve gastrectomy add on to the liver transplant on average that you've noticed? That depends on if the bariatric surgeon lets their fellow do it or if they do it. <laughs> it's about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes extra time. And are those cases typically two surgeon cases for the transplant portion. Um, obviously, there's another surgeon for the from the bariatric team. So we have fellows at our program. So we just usually have a staff and a fellow doing the transplant. And then the bariatric guy. So And we do the mobilization of the greater curve of the stomach. We take down all the short gastrics. And so right when that's done, um, we actually usually call them. And then we do the bile duct while they're waiting you know, to get here. And then they come in, and it's all ready for them. And then they just staple, um, and then they go. So it um, works out really well. <laughs>
So as you showed the picture with the um, gastric bypass and liver transplant, the liver is pristine. So are you much more selective about the livers you take for those patients in the sense that, you know, we go up to 30%, 40% macrosteatosis, and we always worry about giving those livers to people who are at risk for NASH again. And yeah. do you get less restrictive because you are doing the gastric bypass now, or do you get more restrictive? Those are the kind of things that, you know, it's a perfect liver, perfect patient's great, yeah. but if you have a 30 40% macro, do you kind of avoid using them in these obese patients in general? Uh, no, because, you know, we're in a really high meld region, yeah. so we just have to take what we can get, and we don't change our our restriction. Um, we have aborted the mission in two cases. The first time we, we, two cases we intended to do a sleeve at the transplant and we did not. And, that, and one was just that. We had accepted a, a graft that had, um, had a grade four liver laceration and we were having some bleeding from that laceration posteriorly. Um, you know, so it was a pretty marginal graft and it was bleeding and I just did not think it was a good idea to add anything extra in that patient. Um, so we did not do the sleeve for him. Um, and the other patient that we did not, she had had HCC in the setting of NASH, and her, it seemed like her tumor was growing into the diaphragm, so I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be a bad HCC patient. She's going to need post-therapy, and then she's going to be dealing with, you know, trying to restrict her calories, and so I didn't do it for her either. But otherwise, we've done it for everybody, and we use the same graphs that we've used, um, DCD graphs and... Um, fat liver grafts. We don't see any difference. Um, we do biopsy if we're concerned about anything, and the steatosis seems to resolve in those patients just the same. Whether it will be an implication in the long term, I can't say. We've also now done one uh, living donor in the setting of a sleeve with a living donor, um, which was you know, very scary because you don't really know what the graft to body weight ratio should be when the patient's BMI is you know, 49. Do you use the actual weight or do you use the ideal weight? And she had a female donor, so we just sort of used the ideal. You know, the graph to body weight ratio was well under 0.5 if we had used her actual, but the, you know, if using her ideal, it was one. So we have not been restricted in our graph selection because otherwise we would never get these people done. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Julie. It's been terrific. Thank you. Yeah, Good. absolutely. So, a question for you. Yes. Is this a time to have a national registry for people who have undergone bypass and transplantation and do a logical follow-up? Well, that would be cool. Yeah, we have